Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. Welcome to Evening with the Experts, Cervical Arthroplasty. As we all know, cervical arthroplasty has been a really hot topic lately, um, especially with the outpatient and the ASC trends that we see happening out there. Um, so patients are really starting to demand it. And uh, what better time than now to have an event where we uh, have an educational experience where we have a great surgeon panel tonight. We have Dr. Rick Chua out of Tucson, Arizona. Um, he's going to actually cover the Prestige LP uh, design rationale and surgical techniques. So that'll be very um, educational. We're excited about that. We have Dr. Matt Gornett out of Springfield, Missouri, who is going to cover in detail the um, 10 year data for Prestige LP. That's something we're very excited about. The FDA just actually approved the 10-year labeling for the 10-year um, Prestige LP, so you'll find out more there. Very excited about that. And then Dr. Ron Lehman out of New York is here to present some interesting cases and potential complications that you could run into with cervical arthroplasty. So we've got a little bit of something for everybody. We really thank you for joining us tonight. And with that said, I'm going to kick it off to Dr. Rick Chua for design rationale and surgical technique. Thanks, Daniel, and uh, good night. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, I first want to thank uh, Daniel and everyone at Medtronic Medical Education, but uh, most especially to Dr. Lehman and Dr. Gornett for uh, letting me have the privilege of being on the same panel with you guys, uh, well known in the arthroposty uh, experience. So. I've been assigned to talk to you all about uh, the cervical disc arthroplasty system called the Prestige LP. And we're gonna start off by talking about the design rationale and then go through the surgical technique uh, as well as the new streamlined instruments. And then we'll uh, pass it off to uh, Dr. Gornett. Let's see, Joe, there, oops. <laughs> Uh, the disclosures uh, are, uh, I'm obviously involved with Medtronic and I happen to be on the design team for the newest uh, version of the instruments that we call the Streamline Instruments and we specifically focused on trying to make the technique uh, more efficient with less tools, uh, but still give you that reproducible technique of preparing and then implanting the Prestige LP device. Uh, this is the storyboard of Prestige and where we've come from with uh, Medtronic and cervical disc arthroplasty. Uh, the ones to really note are uh, first, the uh, ST came out in 2007 and got the uh, FDA approval, and that active fixation device was similar to the original Medtronic Orion plating system, and many of us have had experience with this. Uh, the downsides to that were the active fixation system, but also uh, the fact that it was made out of stainless steel. So fast forward to 2014 when the FDA approved the Prestige LP device, which is a predominantly titanium device, a ball and trough design. Fast forward to 2016 when the FDA allowed approval for the two level adjacent segment indications. And then in 2017, the refinement of the instrumentation using the streamlined instruments. And as Daniel mentioned, as cervical disc arthroplasty and other surgical procedures are moving into the ambulatory surgery world, we felt it was important to redesign the instrumentation so that there was less uh, need for trays upon trays upon trays uh, to be able to offer these operations uh, in a more efficient fashion. So briefly, we want to review why do we even think about cervical disc arthroplasty. And the reality is, although as spine surgeons, we're experts in spinal fusion and biomechanics, we really want in many cases to restore motion to the physiological spine. And to understand that, we just have to briefly remind ourselves that the cervical spine according to Punjabi's report, has essentially three uh, types of ranges of motion. And we consider these all together as the implants are being designed. Uh, we think a lot about flexion and extension. We think a, a lot about lateral bending and axial rotation. And those are the common motion and kinematics of the cervical spinal uh, segments. But we sometimes forget about translation. And it turns out that uh, with each level, there's up to about two millimeters of translation at each level of the cervical spine. And the combination of the flexion and extension along with translation perhaps is the most important of the biomechanical principles when designing a, a joint to uh, maintain the physiological motion of the joint. So here in Punjabi study, you can see uh, that at each uh, level, 
Uh, there is uh, some degree of flexion and extension up to 10 degrees at C4 and C5, but there's a fairly consistent amount of translation, one to two millimeters, uh, which is not necessarily uh, in and of itself independent of the other ranges of motion, but is important when again, trying to construct a device to maintain the physiological range of motion. The center of rotation is certainly important to note and other devices have different uh, strategies and theories. Uh, the center of rotation using the ball and trough design uh, takes advantage of the posterior portion of the device is located in the sweet spot or the center of rotation uh, for the cervical spine, which is a little bit different than the lumbar spine. And we know that the anatomy dictates the motion because the anatomy dictates where that center of rotation is. And again, in designing a device, we wanna make sure we come as close to the physiological motion as possible. I love these cartoons. They're really very, very simple and straightforward, but they really do show the difference uh, between a ball and socket design, uh, which some implants are, and a ball and trough design. And again, you can see the major advantage of the ball and trough design is to incorporate not only flexion and extension, but that AP translation. Uh, the two-piece construction of the Prestige LP makes it very simple, makes it very reproducible. It is machined out of a titanium ceramic composite. There's no mobile zone. There's no free floating core. There's nothing that reproduces the annulus uh, or the nucleus or anything that you have to inject saline into. It's a very, very simple design uh, taken from the history of the other devices. It is a titanium ceramic composite with a composite of a titanium alloy and a titanium carbide. Uh, you can see the ratio there. What's really important about this is not actually the metallurgy, but the uh, imaging characteristics, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, because it's a titanium alloy, it does not uh, contain the cobalt chromium that we're so used to or the nickel uh, and should have less adverse effects with regard to patient acceptance. There has been basic uh, laboratory studies, rat model studies, and even clinical studies uh, to show that unlike total joints in the hips and knees from the older orthopedic literature, we really shouldn't be concerned about serum ion levels of uh, titanium getting into the bloodstream. Uh, this is just another uh, study that confirms that the uh, median titanium concentration in the serum is actually much lower than a traditional uh, bilateral hip construct, a unilateral hip construct, uh, and even a, a single level fusion with uh, titanium screws. And again, as I mentioned, the best part about a titanium composite being the metallurgy of this device is that it gives favorable MRI characteristics, uh, un uh, unlike some of the other implants, uh, not only from Medtronic, but other companies. And you can see a really good example here up in the top left of the favorable imaging uh, at the level of an index surgery uh, compared to some of the other devices. While the index level may not be the area of concern if we need to image patients down the road, uh, certainly one of the topics that our fellow uh, speakers are gonna talk about is the adjacent level disease. And while I think we can do great surgery at the index level, we do need to be concerned about having excellent visualization for the levels above and level below as seen in this slide. Again, a final uh, topic about the metallurgy. Uh, the uh, LP device is fixated with a compressed fit in the disc space and these small rails uh, that help uh, actively fixate this into the end plate. Uh, the end plate of the devices is spray coated with a pure titanium uh, spray coating to uh, promote some uh, fixation and ingrowth as well. So we'll get to the uh, instrumentation that was redesigned. Uh, again, we wanted to work on a simple, predictable, reliable set of instruments uh, and lessen the load for the reps uh, to be dragging around from center to center. So we came up with a very short four steps of implantation. Uh, once the discectomy and decompression is completed, we're gonna remove our distraction device of whatever choosing, and then we're gonna use a trial to simply find out the height of the disc space that's ideal and the uh, footprint or the foot plate. Once that is selected, a drill guide is going to go coaxial uh, or in a Seldinger technique right over the trial. Uh, through that drill guide, these uh, four uh, pins are going to break the cortex of the bone uh, to engage in fully into the disc space, followed by a hand drill that will place four small holes into the cortex of the end plate above and below. And that prepares for the final step, which is use of the rail punch. 
again, in a coaxial technique, similar to putting in a central line Seldinger technique with the idea of maintaining that uh, perfect center of balance and center of rotation for placement of the implant. This is a, a blown up view of the uh, improved uh, design of the uh, trial, and it gives very favorable characteristics, both intraoperatively on fluoroscopy or under microscopy, uh, to know that you're fully seated each time. And again, it's a very intuitive stepwise approach as you can see here. There are uh, ways that the uh, engineers have designed this such that uh, under fluoroscopy, you confirm adequate placement of the trial, followed by perfect placement of the drill guide, uh, making sure that the drill guide is fully seated. Once the drill guide is fully seated, you can uh, tell that on the fluoroscopy. That allows for a perfect placement of the drill guide holes and finally excellent placement and execution of the rails to allow essentially an accurate and perfect execution of placing the implant. Again, these were designed in a modular type design so that the number of instruments is dramatically reduced. Even though there is a wide variety of sizes of the implants, there is a interlaminar or intervertebral type spreader to help with temporary distraction of the disc space in preparation for implantation. And here you can see the variety of sizes, uh, both in the heights from five millimeters up to seven millimeters and in the footprints from 12 millimeters up to 18 millimeters. Hey Rick, this is uh, Ron. Just a, a quick question about that. One is um, certainly we'll remind all the participants to ask questions with the Q&A function. And then when you um, talk about sizing, what are the more common sizes uh, that you typically use for men and women um, with regards to the sort of five to seven? That's a great question, Ron, thank you. So I, I'd say the most common height size is a six millimeter uh, implant for most men and for most women, a five millimeter height implant. I think of it as I've learned and had experience that it's usually one or even two millimeters shorter than a typical inner body graft that you might do for an ACD fusion. I think we're all taught to put in a big tall graft for an inner body fusion. You get a better fusion rate, you get uh, reduction in subsidence. But with disc arthroplasty, we really want that fit to be perfect. We don't want to put the disc implant in in a distracted state where we're going to impact the facet joints like we do with an ACF, but we don't want it to be too small either where it can be loose. Uh, so really the sweet spot is probably six millimeter uh, implants, potentially seven millimeter implants. Uh, I don't know that I've ever put in an eight millimeter implant, and I don't know that I've even come close to needing a four millimeter implant. And then with those sizes, the heights come a variety of options for the end plate. And the concept is we want that uh, fixation device to be secure. So we want that implant to match, uh, uh, we want the implant to match the end plate as possible. So the most important second part of sizing is we want the uh, implant to be as far back to the posterior disc space as possible. And we'll show that on a couple of x-rays and I think you all will be showing some cases. So we're going to go through the tech really quickly. Again, four steps once the decompression has been completed. There's a trialing step, both height and length. There's the drilling step, rail preparation with a rail uh, cutter, and then the implant. And the following are some uh, diagrams of uh, artist rendition of what it looks like. Patient positioning is similar as you might do with an anterior cervical fusion. Uh, I prefer to keep the neck in a more neutral position because I want to implant the device in a neutral position rather than in a hyperextended or a flexion position. Lateral fluoroscopy is key to the technique. So if the shoulders are in the way, uh, if the neck is really, really large, uh, sometimes you have to do some adjunctive techniques such as oblique views and things like that, but you do really want to get a good lateral view. The uh, decompression and exposure is virtually identical to that of an anterior cervical fusion with the following caveats. One thing we want to do is we want to avoid too much end plate violation. Too much end plate violation can lead to fixation issues. It can also lead to excessive bleeding, which we believe may be one of the indicators for heterotopic ossification. So the other key about the decompression is we really want to make sure that the uncovertebral joint is uh, widely resected, especially posteriorly. And I really try to do a more generous foraminotomy in an ACD uh, arthroplasty than I do with an ACDF. 
again, because we're not using the indirect decompression of a large uh, bone graft. Once the decompression is completed, uh, I generally take out my cast bar pins and my distraction device, which is helpful for the decompression, but we really don't want to use as part of our trialing and implantation. There are these shim distractors to start to get an early idea of the height of the disc space. And again, this uh, implies uh, excellent preparation of that disc space. Uh, and I was taught by one of the original uh, surgeons who designed this to do almost the old letterbox type rectangular decompression from the front of the uncovertebral joints all the way back to the back of the uncovertebral joints, uh, trying to rasp any of the cartilage end plates, but really taking care not to remove much of any of the bony end plates. Early on, we taught a lot of surgeons not to use the burr. I think if you use the burr very carefully, it's certainly very appropriate. We wanna make sure we get uh, good bony ingrowth and good fixation as well. Here, the radiograph show a trial that's too short. Again, we wanna get it all the way to the posterior aspect of the disc space. Uh, and there are plenty of trials and plenty of sizes that should allow to do that. A little bit short would be a little bit better than a little bit long, as you can imagine. The drill guide, again, you can see is actively fixated over the trial. The trial is at the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, and these pins are lightly tapped into the vertebral body to hold the drill guide in place so that ultimately we can use this very tiny hand drill and create these four pilot holes. You can see the artist's rendition of the holes uh, from the distraction posts and then the four holes for that will accept ultimately the rail punch. The next step is uh, guiding this rail punch over the trial and lightly tapping it with a mallet uh, to create the uh, rail fixation uh, uh, channels. And then we can see that the uh, inserter is quite simple to use. It's uh, two pieces. You can directly uh, load the device uh, from the package or from this uh, loading block. And it has to be put in in an appropriate configuration so that the ball is hanging down into the trough of the implant. That takes advantage of the most ideal uh, uh, maintenance of the physiological motion segment. It is not impossible to put the device in upside down. As long as that's recognized early on, it can be removed and put right side up. This is what it looks like uh, down the microscope after it's been implanted. And sometimes a final impactor needs to be used just to fully seat it another millimeter or two. I might add that uh, as a reminder for surgeons, you see these four little tabs with holes in them. Those are oftentimes um, uh, misunderstood as the uh, uh, sort of the, the kick plate. Uh, in other words, putting the implant in all the way until that's flush with the end plate of the retrieval body. Those are actually just the holes for the inserter. So it's not as important that those are flush with the anterior vertebral body as it is, I think, the back half or the back end of the implant being at the back end of the disc space. Uh, so the two uh, level uh, surgical technique is certainly identical to the one level technique, uh, the technique uh, certainly recommends that you do the lower level first, followed by the second level. Not sure that entirely uh, makes a whole lot of difference biomechanically. I generally like to do the more difficult level first and then the more easier level second. And again, this just reviews some of the uh, ideas of preoperative planning. Uh, I really don't do a whole lot of preoperative planning. I don't do with my anterior cervical fusions. Uh, this is what a typical two-level arthroplasty should look like, both on the lateral and the AP views. Uh, smack dab in, the sun, dab in the center in the midline, and you can see these devices. This is probably a millimeter short of posterior, and this one's uh, perfect. Uh, Postoperatively, uh, Dr. Gornett or Dr. Lehman may review the uh, um, restrictions and recommendations from the IDE study, and that's to avoid heavy activities for 60 days. Postoperatively, most importantly, uh, two weeks of an NSAID use to reduce the risk of heterotopic ossification. In the IDE studies, uh, collars were left to the discretion of the surgeons. I certainly don't put any of my patients in collars, and I actually let them go back to uh, virtually all activities with the exception of heavy labor as soon as they can. I encourage them to do range of motion in the normal physiological ranges as soon as they can, and then about a two week uh, course of uh, whatever NSAID is easiest for the patients to remember. Uh, with that, I'm going to sort of buzz through the implant removal slides. Uh, there can be an occasional need to remove the implant 
whether it's in the early postoperative course or delayed, really the easiest way to do that is put some sort of distraction device back in. And then I found the most important thing to use is a small osteotome, uh, sort of right in between the rail punch and the device and the end plate, a couple of light taps, and it could be very easy to uh, knock the implant loose and then grab usually one end of the implant followed by the second end of the implant uh, and then convert that patient most likely to a fusion. Daniel, I'm gonna go uh, in the respect for time, blow through the uh, required slides. And at this point- we got, we got a couple the, of questions coming in guys on the um, Q and A. Yeah, I'll take the first one, Daniel. <clears throat> one of the questions that came in, Rick, was about um, at uh, when you're placing a, an implant, you know, sometimes maybe in larger males, uh, an 18 seems uh, not quite deep enough, almost that you need a 20. And so one of my suggestions was that uh, I think a couple instances where that can happen, probably the most likely scenario is where someone has significant cervical congenital stenosis and oftentimes the vertebral bodies become more rectangular. Um, so it can appear uh, in those instances that uh, the vertebral body is uh, longer anterior to posterior. Uh, but one of the things that you certainly want to do before considering that an 18 isn't deep enough is to make sure you take off all the anterior osteophytes. And I'll show one of my slides about making sure this is flush. Um, and even after using a uh, Ruskin Lexel in the beginning, before we start the disc preparation, I'll take the AM8 high-speed burr and then actually uh, smooth off the anterior aspect of the vertebral body um, just to make sure that you're completely flush because it's very easy to, uh, to not guess that correctly. And if you don't take that down, um, and you go to trial, you'll oftentimes place a trial that's too short um, regardless. So that's the first thing you should really look at is if your implant doesn't seem that you can get deep enough with an 18 is just really make sure you smooth off the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. Yeah, totally agree. And I have a couple of handful of patients, large uh, men who uh, I would have loved to have had a 20 millimeter. I can tell you that clinically they've done very, very well and radiographically no particular issues. Uh, but you make an excellent point, Ron, about making sure it's down all the way anteriorly and uh, sometimes trumpeting out that uh, posterior osteophyte can help at least with the visual that it's not all the way back posterior. Yeah, and you touched on this in your talk, is certainly in terms of your uh, little small movies that you had, but a question came in about uh, speaking about the benefits of the ball and trough translation versus the independent angular rotation and translation of some of the other devices. Just want to touch base on that real quickly again. Yeah, certainly, and, and I'm certainly not a, a, a biomechanical engineer of any sort. I think we're all to some degree uh, students of biomechanical engineering and biomechanics of the spine. I like to combine the biomechanics and reproducibility of the physiological range of motion, but also with the simplicity of the design. I think we can think of all kinds of examples where our devices have got a little too over-engineered and a little too technical, and then there's just more pieces to fail or more combinations of pieces to fail. So I love the idea that a two-piece design ball and trough comes as close as possible to replicating axial uh, rotation, translation, flexion, extension, uh, of which the latter two are the most important. I guess maybe the last uh, question just quickly uh, uh, came in about uh, talking about some of your pearls for end plate uh, preparation um, as you're preparing your inner body space. Yeah, probably no different than what I do for my ACDF. I would say maybe just a little less aggressive. So uh, as I'm doing my discectomy, I, I probably clean out the disc space. I resect the PLL, the osteophyte, open up the foramen. And then just like a fusion, I would go back and be pretty heavy handed with a curette or a rasp to uh, get most of the end plate off. Uh, with a uh, arthroplasty, I'll take that down a notch and I might just use a finer curette I might just use a fine rasp just to get off a little bit of the cartilage to make for a nice uh, uh, implant window for uh, the device. So, so I'd say nothing major other than I'm just less aggressive about removal of the end plate. I think I, I, I can tell you early on, um, I think when you're not actively thinking about the differences uh, as you're doing it, you tend to take off more end plate like you're doing a fusion. And then you may be surprised that your try may, you may have thought was a seven and then all of a sudden it's an eight or larger. Uh, I do remember probably in my first N of 10, I probably prepared too much and then all of a sudden the, the uh, implant was too small and that was before we had some of the larger sizes. So I had to go ahead and do a fusion because I took off too much bone. So do be prepared for that. 
Yeah, I think to highlight one of your statements too, is just make sure you do the technique uh, that works best in your hand. So if you're used to using a high-speed burr for your ACDFs or ACFs, uh, do the same thing, you know, do a good decompression. You have to take the PLL down, uh, but do what's best in your hand. Don't try to change your technique for this implant. Um, make sure your, your decompression is adequate, um, like Rick had pointed out. So maybe with that, we'll go ahead and uh, transition um, to uh, Matt's talk. Okay. Certainly, uh, keep the uh, keep the questions coming. We'll answer those. Uh, they'll get typed in, and we'll answer them in between the uh, sessions, or uh, even interrupt the speaker if uh, we think it's pertinent. Well, thank you. It's a, it's an honor to be here and to talk about the uh, clinical trials. And I think um, all of really our discussions tonight are based on the the strong clinical results that we've seen in these trials. Let's see. And let's see here, so I get this. Okay, I think I got it. Oh. There we go. So uh, I was asked to just briefly go through the 10-year results for the single level study. And, and I think this gives us a little bit of a background and almost a context when we compare it to the multi-level results. I hear my disclosures. The single level study began in 2005. So it's, if you think about it, it's been 15 years. This was a Bayesian non-inferiority clinical trial. Ultimately, the FDA approved single level usage in 2014. And the 10 year post-approval study results were accepted in 2018 and ultimately published. And these publications at, at, at 10 years uh, came after obviously the two seven year results and they were really fairly consistent with those earlier studies. Just as a brief review, the single level study had inclusion of radiculopathy and or myelopathy, NDI scores greater than 30, failing six weeks of conservative care greater than 18 years old. And I think the obvious exclusion criteria were you shouldn't have significant facet disease or osteoporosis. Uh, as stated earlier, the original FDA clinical trial was published in 2015, and this was followed uh, by the seven-year results, which were published in, in 2017, and then the 10-year results in 2019. There was reasonable accountability, and I think the difficult thing you see in all of these studies is to maintain long-term follow-up. Uh, it's important on this clinical trial to understand at 10 years, we use the historical control for fusion for the single level prestige ST. And that was only followed out to seven years. That's why the ACDF um, group at 120 months is left blank because there was no 10 year follow up on the ACDF group. Overall study success for any of you who have participated in FDA clinical trial, Overall study success is a composite. So you have to achieve all of these parameters. So an NDI score of greater than 15 point improvement, maintenance or improvement of your neurologic status, no serious implant or surgery related adverse events, and no surgical uh, secondary procedures. You have to hit all of this, these uh, endpoints to hit overall study success. Now for this clinical trial and only this clinical trial, uh, there was a, another parameter called functional spine unit. And this basically, uh, originally when we didn't know a lot about arthroplasty, this was added in as a possibility to understand whether there was uh, loss of bone fixation or loss of disc height. This was subsequently dropped, but we do have the results uh, both with and without this parameter. Um, and, and again, I believe probably the functional spine unit was, was somewhat arbitrary. If you look at overall study success without the functional spines unit uh, in there, you see that there was st uh, statistical superiority of arthroplasty in overall study success compared to ACDF at seven years. Those uh, overall study success numbers were maintained at 10 years, but again, we don't have a comparator to ACDF. And you could see the results on the right uh, with the functional spine unit. HO, we all talk about HO. Grade three HO at, at 10 years was 19.5%, and grade four, which is essentially ankylosis, was 
So the key points, I think, um, remain safe and effective in their clinical outcomes and significant long-term improvements from baseline were consistent with the previous reports at two and seven years. And there were very few additional surgical AEs or secondary surgeries with the arthroplasty. Now for the two level uh, trial and the 10 year results. Again, this was reported uh, in, in the two year uh, level FDA clinical trial, the whole trial in 2015, and then subsequently the seven year results in 2017 by Todd Landman, and then the uh, 10 year results in 2019. The purpose of this study was really to assess the 10 year clinical safety and effectiveness of prestige LP at two levels and compare that to ACDF. This design was a post-approval study and it followed the two level arthroplasty and ACDF patients in the original FDA clinical trial. And for, for numbers, uh, the ID study had 397 patients. The post-approval study had 256 patients because not all of the study sites uh, enrolled in the long-term follow-up. They didn't feel they could complete that. So the ones that did enroll, there were 256 uh, patients uh, available for that. Again, the primary endpoint of this study was overall study success. This is a Bayesian uh, non-inferiority trial. And so you can achieve superiority if the probability goes above 95%. Uh, and if you do achieve non-inferiority, you can make the assessment of superiority and that was built into the original trial. The key outcome measures we've typically seen, NDI scores, SF36, neck and arm pain numerical scores. For radiographic assessment, we looked at disc height and range of motion. Notice there is no functional spine unit anymore. Neurologic status, adverse events, and additional surgeries were also assessed and work status and patient satisfaction. Again, overall study success, and I, I, I think it's so important when you hear a study saying, well, they only had 68% or 80% overall study success. That is a composite and you have to achieve, again, 15 point improvement or more in NDI and neurologic status that is okay or not worsened and no serious associated implant or procedure associated adverse events and no secondary surgeries. Unless you achieve all of those, you do not achieve overall study success. Again, inclusion criteria, the only real difference here is it had to be two continuous levels. So uh, two levels, for instance, uh, C3, or C3, 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 C4 and C5, 6 would not be considered uh, to be included because they are not continuous levels. Demographically, both groups are similar with the exception of pre-op work status. And why is this important? Because the whole purpose of a, of a randomized study is to eliminate bias. And if demographically the groups are statistically equivalent, that means you're really looking at treatment effect. A high level of patient accountability. And if you remember the, the results of accountability at 84 months um, were in the 70s, but if you look at the 120 months of accountability, 86% for arthroplasty and essentially 85% for ACD. F. And this is the most robust study with long-term outcomes that's ever been done. Uh, there are no really, that I'm aware of, prospective randomized assessments at multi-levels at 10 years with this type of follow-up. And so it's quite an accomplishment and the study sponsor should really be commended for following these patients. Dr. Gornett, I, I want to jump in and, and I know you're biased because you were in the original study group, but uh, I certainly was taught early on and it, it seems to be the case that the original study followed by the two level study really is from a scientific standpoint, one of the best studies ever done in the spine literature. Uh, you, can't ran, you can't really randomize and you can't blind these studies because the implants look different on post-operative imaging. But uh, I think uh, kudos to you and all the study or participants uh, pulling off an amazing scientifically sound study that that ultimately delivers the results and thank you and, and i think you know from the team standpoint just to get the follow-up of these patients at 10 years was quite an accomplishment to track them down 
but that allows the data and, and the conclusions to really be robust and, and, and help us um, really guide patients in, in not only how they are expected to do in the short term, but also the long term. Uh, the median return to work, uh, there was statistically significant early return to work in the single level study for arthroplasty. This trended uh, the same way uh, for arthroplasty, but it did not hit statistical significance compared to fusion. Uh, angular motion was maintained. And I think the importance of this is uh, that once you achieve motion, that motion is pretty much maintained out through 10 years, we don't see a fall off. Obviously, I'll talk a little bit about HO later on, those patients would fall off, but for the most part in the study, motion was maintained. And here's just an example, uh, angular motion superior level was 6.92 and at the inferior level, 6.85 on average. This is one of our 10 year fall off patients. Overall study success, but remember that's the composite uh, where you have to achieve NDI scores and no secondary surgeries and neurologic status and no serious AEs. You can see that, that we achieve statistical superiority for prestige LP over ACDF at all time points, two years, three years, five years, seven years, and 10 years. And so, and these results did not drop off. And so what, what you're seeing here is, is again, um, the, the, the position that I think now there is a new uh, gold standard for multi-level uh, cervical disease at two levels, and that would be arthroplasty. If we look at NDI scores, again, what you're seeing here is statistical superiority of prestige LP at two levels over ACDF at three years, five years, seven years, and 10 years. And so these results continue to be maintained. And I think that's the important uh, take home from this. NDI success. So the percent of patients who achieve 15 points or more, you, you see posterior uh, probability of superiority, 99%. So statistical superiority on NDI scores, 15 point improvement uh, maintained out through 10 years. Neurologic success. And this took me a little bit by surprise but I think if you think about it, it makes sense. What you see is again, statistical superiority of neurologic success um, at not only seven years, but 10 years. And I think at large part, this may be related to uh, patients who don't ultimately go on to heal at ACDF. They may have micromotion, inflammation. We've all seen patients who do reasonably well initially with pseudoarthrosis that become painful over time. And I think this data may reflect that, although that's my personal assessment. Hey, Matt, you yeah. know, it's been, it's been my impression that that could also be explained by uh, maybe taking a little bit more care to do the foraminotomy and taking a little bit more care of preparing the implant uh, rather than just jacking the disc space up. And we know that there is a higher percentage of subsidence with ACDF than there is with arthroplasty. And I think when you lose some of that neurological uh, success, I think it's maybe due to subsidence and maybe recurrent stenosis, recurrent radiculopathy. What are your thoughts think, on that? I think that's an excellent point. And actually in listening to your presentation, um, we always look at our failures and I've, I've gone back and I, I fully agree with your assessment of doing a, a nice frame anatomy because those have been patients who, um, I think I'm humbled a little bit when I didn't do enough because there is still motion present. I think they may get a little bit of micro irritation if you don't do that. So it's interesting. Your conclusions were pretty much identical to what I said. So I commend you on that one. So, um, so for neck pain scores, again, uh, in some ways you, you, you almost expect patients neck pain to improve over time. We know that intradiscal pressures um, go up significantly at the adjacent segments, particularly with more than one level being fused. And so you see, again, statistical superiority of prestige LP at two levels compared to ACDF. And this is maintained out through 10 years. Neck pain success is just another way. How many patients achieved a 15 point improvement um, in their neck pain score and um, and you could see again, statistical superiority over ACDF. Arm pain, uh, 
no significant difference here. I think people did um, uh, decompressed uh, well, and so their arm pains in, improved in both, so there was no statistical difference. And arm pain success, again, no statistical difference. PCS, and, and most of these now are not um, uh, statistical different. There was no difference between the two groups in SF36 PCS. Secondary surgeries, unfortunately, they left off I think one of the most important uh, columns here, so it, it's somewhat illustrated in the next slide, but uh, the 10 year follow up for CDA, there was 4.7 uh, reoperations, 4.7% for the arthroplasty group and 17.6 in the ECDF group at the index levels. So 4.7 versus 17.6. If you look at adjacent levels, there was 9% adjacent level reoperations in the arthroplasty groups and 17.9% in the ACDF group. So that was statistically significant um, in, in both categories. So you're seeing more and more reoperations in the ACDF group and more adjacent level failure in the ACDF group. The next slide illustrates this, again, showing statistical superiority in less adjacent level surgeries with two level arthroplasty compared to ACDF. Grade three, grade four, I think it's, it's easier to lump these two together um, because those are what we would call significant HO. Uh, and this is consistent with most of the other implants. But what you see here is at five years, you're around 39% and it's around 39 to 40% at seven years and 10. So there is no significant uh, increase in HO after five years. We see it peak and then is relatively maintained. Patient satisfaction uh, was obviously excellent um, in, in these, both patients groups did well. So the key points, I think for people that worry about arthroplasty and to hear about HO, HO is stable after five years. We don't see this increasing bone growth over time. Statistical superiority over ACDF achieved at 10 years for overall study success, NDI scores, neck pain, neurologic success. Significantly fewer secondary surgeries, not only for the arthroplasty group at the index level, but less surgeries also at the adjacent levels, statistically significant. So in conclusion, uh, uh, these just, I think demonstrates what the two year data show that this is a safe and effective way to manage cervical radiculopathy and myelopathy. And uh, these results are consistent and maintained from two years, five years, seven years, 10 years. I think it allows you to talk to your patients about how this will factor in their life over, over time. And thank you very much, that's it. That was great, Matt, um, amazing data. And, and I might add, I think it's uh, behooves everyone to acknowledge Matt and the group's uh, important work here because these results also, they also have allowed the um, insurance plans to start to reimburse these uh, devices and these procedures, which were very rarely approved five years ago, 10 years ago, and now at least in the Southwest, we're not really having much trouble with getting approval for the appropriate indications for arthroplasty. And I might uh, go to the chat, um, remind all the audience to uh, submit your questions in the Q&A portion, and Daniel will filter that to us. A lot of questions about the appropriate indications for arthroplasty. Um, I think we've glossed over it a little bit, and but we want to talk about you know, how much degeneration of a facet joint, facet arthropathy, disc space narrowing, end plate changes, posterior osteophyte, how much of that uh, is important to consider, uh, Ron and Matt, especially for the early success for uh, surgeons in their early experience? Yeah, I can take that if you want, uh, Matt. You know, one of the things that sort of came up too was, was that a component uh, of assessment in the initial uh, trial? I'm not sure if there was a grading system then, but um, was there an assessment of facet arthropathy other than on plain radiographs when you initially did this uh, study when you started it? I don't believe there was an assessment. You could not have, you were excluded if you had significant facet disease. And I think that that was 
left to the discretion of the clinicians. And so uh, we did not specifically look at grading the facets and if you were excluded, if you had a certain beyond a certain grade. So it was it was given discretion. And I think Rick, that's, it's an important point. We published, uh, Dan Brew and I published in 2009 in Spine, looking at facet arthropathy, um, MRI versus CT scan. And so as you can imagine, if it was a perfectly normal facet, or a completely ankylosed facet, you could pick it up on MRI, but the sort of grade one to four, you really couldn't. Um, and so really from that study, we began doing CT scans very routinely in everyone, and even on younger patients. And so we have had 22 year old patients who have had significant facet arthropathy. And the downside if you have facet arthropathy and you get a cervical TDR is you can often get you know facet loading, but you can also get pain in between your shoulder blades that doesn't always go away. And so we always warn patients um, you may have a little bit of scapular pain. It usually gets better within a couple of weeks to a couple of months, unless you have significant facet arthropathy. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's definitely important to evaluate the preoperatively because radiographs are very difficult uh, to ascertain how much arthropathy they have, unless it's ankylosed, uh, which would be a significant case. And I would, I might add, an easy way to assess the the segment is to make sure that there's range of motion. So we don't oftentimes do X-rays to make sure there is motion. We're looking for x-rays for findings of excessive motion, but even in young healthy people or middle-aged uh, persons with mild degeneration, as long as you see the anterior disc space close down in flexion and the interspinous process get bigger in flexion, and when you go into extension, you see the disc space open up a little bit and the interspinous process space go down a little bit, you've got physiological motion still there. And if there is physiological motion still there, then I think that's a good way to sort of analyze the, the degeneration of the segment. Some of the key things I know I used early on is making sure that the disc space is not more than 50% collapsed. I think that's a, a good point to say uh, too much degeneration, uh, although subjective. And then your point about uh, facet arthropathy is an excellent point. Patients with air in the facet joints, there's probably uh, either too much arthropathy or too much motion. So those are all very subtle imaging findings. I will tell you that I think all of us had the most amount of success with soft disc herniations without much spondylosis and hard bone spur osteophyte formation. But over time, as you get your results and get your experience, you find that you can get away with a little bit more degeneration in those segments. Okay, I think we covered um, the questions in the chat about indications. Um, Ron, you're up. Okay. All right, so since I'm not as smart as Rick and Matt, uh, they gave me the talk, the mule talk, which is basically uh, the tips and pearls of actually doing the surgery itself. And I think this is where the sort of rubber hits the road because, you know, like Rick and Matt have both pointed out, it's very important to understand what patient's gonna do well with this operation. And if you choose the patient poorly, regardless of how well you do the surgery, um, it's not going to work. But there's certainly some things you want to consider, and we'll go through a bunch of these things um, in this talk. And, and certainly also make sure that you text some of the questions in, because I think uh, this will generate um, quite a bit uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of discussion. Here are my disclosures. So here's a representative case. This is one of the first cases of Prestige LP that I did. Um, and, you know, Rick just sort of pointed out, we talked about the relative contraindications. And this patient had a 5, 6, and 6, 7 uh, level uh, pathology with a C6 and a C7 radiculopathy. But, you know, more than 50% loss, height of loss or uh, loss of height there at C6, 7. And so this was a discussion uh, with the patient because the MRI always makes it look better. And that's why I think it's important really to look at the radiographs because that gives a different appreciation. Uh, we can see his leftover extremity weakness. He was actually a, a police officer who flew in from um, outside the state. Um, and we look at these things and we say, well, what, what's really the best operation? He wanted to get back to work, wanted to get back to the, to the police force. And a two-level fusion uh, in that situation is job limiting. So one of the things we do initially is we place our Casper pins. And I'll actually critique myself here as I would have liked to get a little bit more parallel to the vertebral body. But you want to make sure, especially in keeled devices, that when you place your cast bar pins, you place them further away from the end plates. Because oftentimes you can use your cast bar pins in terms of internal and external distraction to make sure you can see your posterior osteophytes well and put your PLL on tension, which makes it much easier to take down. But also really helps us make the disc space parallel. 
And when we look at this in terms of sizing, and this is the one of the questions we brought up before is, when you place your trial, you really wanna make sure that you're the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. So in this particular case, uh, this was a 16. So a six by 16, and it wasn't quite deep enough. And so if you see this and you're not within two millimeters of the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, you wanna take that trial out and place a deeper one because ultimately having the center rotation in the perfect place is really gonna set this patient up for success. And so this is critical, but you also have to take up this anterior osteophyte to make sure that your trial is flush with the anterior aspect of the vertebral body itself. And so when we do this, you can see here how with a high-speed burr, we made and plane this flush. And so we place our trial, we know that exactly where we're placing that is exactly what we're seeing. And so if our depth is 16, we're gonna know exactly what it is. And I think this is important to continue to keep this in your mind as you do these procedures. This technique is incredibly important and then once again, going through the steps, um, placing our chisel as well as our implants, uh, we wanna make sure that we're within two millimeters of that posterior aspect. And once again, in a lordotic position. And so we don't wanna overlordose, but we also place the neck roll as well as the shoulder roll, which I've now taken that and adopted that to my ACDF technique as well, um, because I do think it gives nice support, especially when you're using this rail punch because it can generate a little bit of force much better with the newer in, uh, implants and instruments uh, than the previous ones. And then once again, we take our AP, but we also know when we look at this, we can't really judge this well because the spinous processes are four or five centimeters different. And so if we look at these, we may think this is a little bit off center, um, but I'll show you a trick and technique that you really wanna use when you judge where you're gonna place your trial and ultimately your implant. And then this particular patient, we end up doing a two level uh, disc replacement. And like we said before, even though this patient had uh, some disc height collapse more at C6-7, we basically placed a little bit of a smaller implant because if you have facet arthropathy of any uh, amount or if you overstuff a level, that patient's gonna have facet distraction and have a very difficult time uh, oftentimes uh, taking care of that. And that's one of the things that's very forgiving about an ACDF is that with limited motion, um, that makes it a little bit better and a little bit more forgiving. So adherence to the technique is incredibly important when we talk about the, these type of operations. Um, and then you can see here the final intraoperative fluoro shot and then once again, the post-op, you can see on the AP, this is exactly where it should be placed because it's based upon the anatomy, not based upon the AP fluoro shot. And this is one study that we published now over 10 years ago with a pretty large series of over uh, 260 patients looking at TDR versus ACDF and very similar to what was pointed out before is really for every single category with 170 in this group, just from uh, my one of my part, neurosurgery partners and I at Walter Reed, um, you can see our outcomes were similar and statistically were better than ACDF, obviously, but both of these operations can do quite well uh, when indicated. But ultimately, when we do any type of surgery, an ounce of prevention, prevention is certainly worth a pound of cure. So taking these things into consideration before we even start is incredibly important. And one of the things that I always sort of harp on is looking at the anatomic midline. The AP fluoroscopy certainly can, um, can throw us off at times. And we've certainly seen this. Uh, this is a case uh, with a different implant, but you can see when you look at the AP, um, you can't really tell exactly if it's in perfect position. The lateral is always relatively good as long as you have a nice uh, uh, on-foss view of the uh, end plates and the facet joints. But then ultimately, if you don't place it perfectly, this is what the post-op film looks like. And when you see this on radiographs, regardless of what type of implant you have, this patient ended up having left upper extremity radiculopathy because that foramen was collapsed relatively. So certainly look at the anatomy itself uh, and don't always rely on the AP fluoroscopy. The lateral fluoroscopy is key, but the AP, I think looking at the patient and looking at the vertebral joints really ensures that you're in the center. So this is a, a typical dissection uh, that I perform because you really wanna be able to see the uncinates. And you certainly, you look at this and you sort of think of it like a goalpost. This also helps you ensure that you're gonna do a, a great foraminotomy. Uh, I think as Rick and Matt both pointed out is that if you do a very good foraminotomy, you really have to decompress the nerve roots well, because if you don't, a motion sparing device will continue to move and, and obviously produce motion postoperatively, and that can irritate the nerve. So the foraminotomy is incredibly important to do. And when you expose basically out to the uncidents, you're very sure that you're lateral enough. And so this is no different. And uh, Rick can't, can't make fun of me. I wasn't wearing a leather helmet, but this is one of the pictures uh, from uh, my college football team. So our uniforms looked a little bit different, but 
I look at the uncertainty, it's basically like being a goalpost. And you really want to make sure that when you kick the field goal, it's right down the middle. But once again, when you know the boundaries of the goalpost or the boundaries of the uncertainty, you can ensure that you're going to place the implant in the, in the perfect position. And once again, fluoroscopy can throw us off a little bit. So we always want to keep this in mind. And this wide decompression, once again, incredibly important. It helps you take the osteophytes down. And this is really important, especially for radiculopathy. And once again, I take this now and I use this for my ACDFs as well. And so when I go to uh, do an ACDF, if I'm going to use allograft bone, I place two of these side by side. So once again, by seeing the incidence, ensuring you do a good foraminotomy, I now have 22 millimeters of bone graft surface, which has to be better for fusion. And we've certainly seen over the years that uh, we can see some of these implants, some of the allografts will fuse, one will fuse and the other one won't. And I think having uh, this arthroplasty experience really helps you do a better ACDF. And I think we really want to take all of our techniques for all these operations and be able to transfer these onto other things that we do, ultimately making ourselves better and helping the patients out. But there are some potential complications when we talk about cervical TDR. And these are sometimes specific to the implant, um, but oftentimes these are as much iatrogenic as anything else. And we can see we can have expulsion uh, of the implant. Um, and once again, surgical techniques are important. Heel devices have their own challenges, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those as well. But also placement of the caspar pins is incredibly important because it can propagate fractures, as we've seen and has been published uh, many times uh, over the years. Heterotopic ossification is one of the things that we get concerned about and we worry about, but um, even in the five and seven year data studies, the patients that end up having HO ended up doing fine afterwards because they weren't moving. So it was very similar to an ACDF. And with that lack of motion, the nerve also is not as irritated. We've seen cases of vertebral body osteolysis. And so this can be very significant. You can see uh, how something like this would occur and the salvage for this would then be a corpectomy. Um, so you can go, do from, go from a one level to a two level uh, type surgery, especially if you propagate a fracture or have a neurologic deficit all things we want to keep in mind. But ultimately, when we place the Caspar pins and we look at a patient like this that's very spondylotic, has listhesis, has relative kyphosis, this is a potential setup to have a problem because with the addition of extra carpentry, you can see in this particular patient, which is a published study, with the implant being very anterior, basically placed into flexion, and then the Caspar pins created a stress riser resulting in a vertebral body fracture which can be very catastrophic comparatively and can result in neurologic deficit. So all these things I think are critical. And with keel devices, you have to be a little bit more cautious with these uh, because oftentimes these implants get placed in the relative flexion or relative extension can then cause a flexion or extension block. Uh, but ultimately a lot of these things can be mitigated as we actually do the case itself um, and the surgery. And so here's a case of a, another keel device. Uh, once again, the implant was a little bit too large. That can result in an issue. And ultimately, this patient ended up going on to heterotopic ossification, required a revision, which sometimes can be done with posterior foraminotomies, but sometimes have to be done with uh, explant. So one of the ways uh, that we help, even with the Prestige uh, LP, is that after we do our procedure, um, obviously with the uh, rails there um, and the keel devices with the chisel, we'll take bone wax and put it over the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. And so all this to sort of help uh, mitigate um, all the um, uh, mesenchymal cells uh, coming out of the vertebral body. In addition, we use copious uh, irrigation throughout cases like this seven, eight, nine times. And I think all these things are important. Um, especially when we use the high-speed burr and other things to help uh, do our decompression and our foraminotomy. And so this uh, same exact case, uh, you can see the question is, is this implant too wide? Is it too tall? It can result in an inadequate decompression, which was also not performed here. And once again, if you don't perform an adequate decompression, those are the patients that can really get into trouble postoperatively. In addition, you get adjacent like level problems. And so ASD is not just the fact of doing a fusion, but it's a fact of not achieving alignment. And so in this patient that become that had an arthroplasty, which should decrease ASD based upon the uh, seven and 10 year data that Matt touched on. But if you don't have the patient in good alignment, they don't have lordosis, they'll get ASD from that as well. So all these things, once again, are technique driven. Um, and one of the big issues with keel devices, and I think this is a little trick that I picked up uh, using a different implant over 10 or 12 years ago, is I now take a micro nerve hook and after doing the, um, the uh, by after I place uh, the uh, pins in order to, to get my troughs, uh, 
I take a micro nerve hook under the microscope and I clean out. There's always a little bit of a posterior bone that's placed there after you chisel down. And by getting that out, it allows you to make sure that you seed your implant posteriorly enough. In addition, it doesn't go into relative flexion. So there's a little trick that I think uh, is incredibly important. There's always a little piece of uh, bone that's in the back of that trough and it really helps to uh, clean that out. So I think when we look at all these uh, different techniques, these are things that we really do on every single case. And once again, we take some of the arthroplasty um, experience and transform it to ACDFs as well. But we uh, copiously irrigate and that's seven, eight, nine times with a, with a large uh, irrigator. Postoperatively, we always put our patients on non-steroidals for about three weeks, um, as Matt pointed out, and that was also done in the trial. I think those things all help. Uh, indications and making sure that the patient is optimized uh, to have this uh, procedure are incredibly important. You have to take the PLL, PLL down, uh, one, to make sure that you can recess the implant posteriorly enough so the center rotation is where it needs to be, and secondarily, to be able to provide and uh, to get an adequate decompression. You really want to be able to pass a standard nerve hook lateral to the pedicle at that level because that ensures that your frame is adequately decompressed. If you can't palpate the lateral aspect of the pedicle, you haven't decompressed uh, wide enough and you need to continue to do that. And once again, look at the uncidents. Um, and so just like in football and in uh, the movie, uh, White Man Can't Jump, right? The ball doesn't lie. And so if you're in the middle of the goalpost and you know where your goalposts are at, you're gonna do a much better job of putting that uh, right in the middle. So incredibly important. So don't rely on the AP fluoro, but the lateral fluoro is mandatory. That really helps you recess your uh, device and then once again, square off your uncidents, do a good disc prep, just like you would for uh, every other operation. And I think if you adhere to some of these basic things, you can really take uh, a few years of the learning curve um, uh, off your uh, practice. That was great, Ron. Hey, I wanna go back. Uh, I know we probably can't go back on the slide, but your video of the wax uh, also showed, and you didn't mention it, burring down that anterior aspect of the vertebral body. Uh, and again, that's going to get a really nice uh, sized fit. Um, don't necessarily want to burr it down until you get to bleeding bone, but the next slide you'll show, you can tell you've burred down the uh, anterior vertebral body, which, which makes for a nice uh, visualization of putting that placement in. A couple of questions in the chat uh, for maybe Ron and Matt. Uh, the first is um, reimbursement uh, compared to ACDF. And uh, I assume that question is both surgeon reimbursement and potentially facility reimbursement. Yeah, Matt, you're probably better at the uh, facility reimbursement. I know for you know standard you know um, CMS usual and customary, the disc arthroplasty is a little bit less than the ACDF. Um, and Matt, what about surgery center versus facility fee and that type of thing? I think it's it's similar, but now newer contracts. I think what happened is originally the group of carriers arthroplasty is being dangerous because implant costs would rise and all the people would get this. And what they've seen with the improvement in outcomes is, at least from the facility standpoint, they're starting to incentivize, I think, moving from, uh, arth uh, from fusion to arthroplasty. So we're getting better contracts, uh, which would, I think, make it a win-win. There is still a decreased reimbursement for surgeons for arthroplasty uh, compared to uh, fusion. But I don't think that matters as much because I think having a great result in patients and looking at the data showing statistical superiority, uh, in the long run, you're gonna drive the equation by having happier patients, better results, and they're gonna tell hundreds of patients more that you've done a great job and that tends to, to way outweigh any decreased reimbursement, at least in my personal experience. There's a question in the chat about um, a segment that has a, a kind of a more than average concavity of the, so the inferior end plate of the superior vertebra and how technically uh, Ron or Matt, you would deal with that to try to get a nice fit of the implant. I'm gonna take that first round and then I'll give my comments. Yes, yeah, so I think one of the most important things is to really make sure that you square things up. The most common area where you sort of get hung up is the uh, posterior caudal aspect of the caudal level. Um, so, um, you know, sort of out in the corners. And that's the area, I think, obviously, when you do compression. So, you know, once again, we use the internal distractor, take a little bit of stress off the Casper pins, and you distract out. Uh, you put the tension on the uh, PLL to make sure you get your posterior osteophytes. And then you got to really work on the uncidents, uh of the caudal level 
um, out laterally. So no different than when you do an A lift, it's the same, same part that really gets hung up. And if you don't square that off, uh, that can really kick your implant out. I also think it's important to take off a little bit of the anterior inferior lip, just like we do with ACDF. And once again, each arthroplasty is different. So if you're using a Brian implant, you want to keep that on some, to make sure that it doesn't uh, expose out the front. But with a keel device, especially the LP, it's nice to take off that lip. So it really helps you make everything parallel. So you're basically going from the anterior aspect of the uh, lip, you take it off with the ambient high speed burr, and you're basically right down on the cartilage. You can take that sort of straight back. And I think that's the most important thing. And also to recognize if you're a little bit more lordotic preoperatively, don't place your patient in as much lordosis on the table. So we use a neck roll, um, which is nice, um, as well as the shoulder roll. And I think the opposite is true. We know that these uh, arthroplasty devices can be kyphogenic. Um, and so if you have a patient that has significant kyphosis, even segmental kyphosis, that may be another sort of relative contraindication that you may want to do an ACDF in that situation to induce lordosis so we don't have adjacent problems. And so I think patient selection is certainly a lot of it and then the technique really sort of rounds that out. My, my comment for that, uh, I, I echo everything Ron's saying. What I would say is I, I do two things. One is, is pitfalls. If you look at their preoperative neutral standing cervical film lateral, it'll give you an idea where those discs are in space. And, and that's important because on the table, I do the same thing Ron does where I put the rolls in. And so I try to push them into a little bit more lordosis. But you also have to factor when you're putting that disc in, what is the position on the table and how does that position compare to their normal standing uh, post -op or pre-op assessment? And that'll help you build in sort of whether you need that implant a little more lordosis, neutral, and, and, and it'll help prevent, oftentimes we see a little kyphosis potentially in an implant after surgery. And I think that's a miscalculation uh, by the surgeon about how much um, uh, extension to build in or they didn't read the patient appropriately. And so those are all part of learning curves. But if you really look at that on the table and then look at it preoperatively, that will give you an assessment. The second thing that I've seen is rotation. And so in, when you're stacking multiple implants, if you rotate the neck a little bit and you think you have your center point, that could actually throw you off a little bit just like and so you're looking straight down through the microscope just like the view is on the on the projector but if you've rotated that a millimeter or so you may find that you place your implant a little bit off to one side or the other so really take that lateral floral and make sure that your facets are parallel we we actually tape the head in position so it can't move we put blocks on each side we put them in tongs so that we try to control rotation and that becomes more critical the more implants you place. Yeah, I think it's actually another great point too is we tape uh, the head in neutral. We take three inch silk yeah. tape and uh, take it once again, right. sort of everything's like the goalpost mentality, right? So you have to make sure that your head's not rotated like this because you're still gonna, that's like the wind blowing the football out of the goalpost. So if everything's sort of zero 90 degrees, it really helps you sort of go right in the middle. So clearly, last, clearly <laughs> Ron, Clearly, Ron is excited that NFL football is back. Uh, and I think what we'll do is try to wrap up. There's one uh, great question in the chat room, and then uh, we'll just let all the faculty answer it. Um, here is a case of a 35-year-old woman with a pure soft disc herniation on the left at C67, but has mild to moderate, a pure, uh, I assume, bony uncle hypertrophy degeneration on the right. So some degree of stenosis on the right from bony disease has left arm pain only, arthroplasty versus ACDF. Arthroplasty, take down the, always decompress the other side, even though it's not symptomatic, because again, you can be humble that it becomes symptomatic post-surgery just from change in load. So I would decompress that other side, but remove the soft disc. Patient will be very happy with that result. Yeah, I would echo that too. And I think you know, I'll probably uh, triple down on this concept, but you know, after starting arthroplasty early in my uh, practice, um, I take the PLL down in every case now um, because uh, A, it ensures that I'm decompressing the bilateral foramina, even if they have you know, left-sided symptoms, I always do the same thing on the right side as well uh, because you'd hate for that patient to come back at some point in the future and then complain about that uncle vertebral hypertrophy. But 
I think this is a, a great case for that. Obviously, you want to make sure you look at the facet joints. I think I don't want to underscore that because 35 is obviously very young, but we've seen 22-year-olds with significant facet arthrosis. So you can really have it at any age. Uh, but uh, in, in light of not having significant facet arthritis, I think this is a great case for an arthroplasty with a bilateral decompression, obviously taking the PLL down uh, all the way across. And I, I'm going to take uh, uh, the opportunity to ask Ron one last question. I've always been asked, wanted to ask you this. Um, I think you did arthroplasty when you were back at Walter Reed. Did you do these on um, jet pilots? And what was the experience clinically, the ability to go back to flying a jet with the G-forces, et cetera, uh, regarding post-operative care? Yeah, it's actually a great question. So um, it's one of the few times I did a lot of arthroplasties in the military because I had a very young population and it was sort of perfect. And I had people, I've had people go back to essentially everything, every type of, you know, contact, uh, go back to combat, jump out of airplanes, uh, static jumps, halo jumps, division one wrestlers, MMA. Uh, unfortunately, I had a few patients injured in combat uh, with um, uh, IEDs and uh FFPs blown up, come back with amputation. So we've seen it be put under a lot of stress in situations that are not similar to what we obviously have here. Um, and um, but the one downside is uh, fighter pilots. So fighter pilots, uh, they estimate uh, cost about six million dollars to train, and obviously a bunch of years. And they had a very strict criteria that you could not have a disc arthroplasty. Uh, you could not have a two-level fusion in your neck or you'd be basically, you'd get what's called a downslip where you would not be allowed to fly. Um, and so I don't know, it's been since 2014 since I've been out. Um, likely it has not changed because it's like I'm trying, trying to turn an oil tank around in the Atlantic. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, but, you know, despite that, you know, having people do, you know, one patient I had had done 60 uh, jumps out of an airplane at the six-month point after surgery. I've had someone jump out of a static line jump uh, six weeks after um, a, a ST, a prestige ST at the time, because they have a, obviously good rigid fixation. That was the one that was approved at the time. But um, so the hope is that, uh, you know, they see the light. And if you can, once again, do a static line jump, if you can get involved in an IED and, and an explosion and still not, uh, um, you know, have any implant failure, that's more significant really than anything that we could ever um, do with, you know, flying a jet. It was a long answer for no. No, that was awesome. I've been waiting for years to ask you that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, again, I think uh, I'm just going to take the opportunity to thank everyone that attended tonight. I know it's late, uh, especially on the East Coast, but thanks for joining us. Um, this is the new world of uh, education, and I, I know I can speak for Ron and Matt. We've thoroughly enjoyed being with you, um, sharing our experience, and some, and mostly the data of Matt and the group on a 10-year disc arthroplasty for both one and two levels. I think as to echo Ron's points, if you stick with the indications, be really, really strict with your indications, do great technique because we all know that you're good surgeons, uh, pick your patients wisely. I think that you'll find, uh, as I have found, if I have to have a cervical disc surgery done, I'm getting an arthroplasty by one of these two guys or one of my partners rather than a fusion simply for that 50% reduction in adjacent level disease over two years. So I uh, congratulate everyone for being with us tonight. I uh, thank again Daniel and uh, all of Medtronic and MedEd for allowing us to do this. Uh, it sure beats getting on an airplane for sure. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to Daniel. Thank you, Dr. Chua. We, we really appreciate it. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. We know that you have options on other things that you could be doing, um, whether you're leaving the house or, or just virtually. So Dr. Chua, thank you so much for running us through, you know, design history back to 1991. And then Dr. Gornett, we've got the 10 year data um, here 30 years later. And then Dr. Lehman, you know, you've, you've shared some really nice case examples and potential oh. watch outs there. So yes, uh, the field goal. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. And we look forward to catching up with you very soon. Thanks everybody, be safe. Thanks everyone. Bye.